Hey, it's Jeff. Uh, I don't have a guided listening for you today, but I got one better for you. I have one of the Digging Deeper videos. I'm out of town. I'm in Las Vegas right now. I came to town for a series of some big band gigs, which were very fun. I went to the Las Vegas Academy High School for the Performing Arts. Holy cow, those kids are playing great. And then tonight, I have a gig that I'm looking forward to with my friend from years and years ago at North Texas, Uli Geisendorfer great piano player. So I'm so happy he invited me to uh, come and play tonight. So since I'm not making a video for you, I've got this great one on this concept of harmonic gravity. I think it's a really fruitful uh, framework. So I'll be interested in uh, to know what you think about it. So of course, leave posts here, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're seeing this. But the real work we're going to get done is inside Jazzwire. I hope I'll see you there. Enjoy the video. <laughs> Everybody. Jeff Antoniak here. Welcome to Digging Deeper Jazz. So this week I've got a cool idea to talk to you about and this is harmonic gravity. What is harmonic gravity? Um, it's a concept, by the way, this is for all instruments as always, right? This is not a saxophone thing. Harmonic gravity. People have been asking me, I've gotten a lot, a lot of emails, a lot of uh, contacts from folks out there. Thank you, by the way and um, wondering about the language of modern players and trying to analyze solos where things just don't seem to make a lot of sense. And I have this idea that I call harmonic gravity. Um, this is something I picked up from studying with the great Tim Hagens, one of the greatest improvisers on the planet. Um, and I studied with him because I loved the language he was using. I'm obviously not a trumpet player, right? And um, this idea that I kind of put together in my head of harmonic gravity. Now, I keep saying that, that I, put, I, I use this phrase. I may not be the only one. I think I also invented internet memes and like chocolate and peanut butter together. So, you know, perhaps other people have come up with those ideas as well. I'm not sure. So harmonic gravity. Let's go with I invented that, okay? So this image of we know what it's like to be on earth and to feel ourselves pulled against the ground as much as we are, right? And we understand from our, you know, uh, fifth grade science textbook that on the moon, we weigh less. We, we feel like, you know, we can jump further, things like that. On another planet, we would weigh five times more. And that, that interesting concept, right? Well, what about if we had a knob, you know, like in a science fiction movie where they can turn the artificial gravity on and off and they turn it off and people start floating, things weigh less. They turn it on and everything goes back to the ground. I like that image. I, I want that. I want, if you have one of those, send me that knob. I'd love that. Yeah. So I'm talking about a harmonic gravity knob. What about if we had a knob where we could have it set to us being right inside the chord changes? Cool, that's what a lot of us uh, aspire to. That's bebop playing, that's great bebop playing. What if we could turn that totally off and we're almost, let's call it, unencumbered by the chord changes, but we're still playing great music. We're not bad musicians or playing bullshit. We're still playing real stuff, but it's not heavily into the ground like that, right? It's still legitimate stuff, but it's floating around. What if we could turn the harmonic gravity knob to halfway and now we're hovering closer to the changes? We're not in the changes, but we're around the changes. We're above the changes. What would that be like? Cool. So that's this concept of harmonic gravity. So if nothing more than thinking about harmony as being like gravity, it's not a set thing. Okay, harmony guys, I know the theory people are going to yell at me, but what about that? Let's, let's just have that be our thought experiment. This idea that the strength of harmony could be variable. Well, I think a lot of modern players play in that way. Or maybe uh, players who have really developed their free playing, their free jazz sense um, of how they can play fantastic melodies, but not really be locking it into a harmony. So that's a little bit what's going on. All right, let's look at this sheet that I put together for you folks. By the way, uh, these PDFs for all the Digging Deeper series are free to you. I want to send you this stuff. I want you to work on this stuff and become a better musician. That's what I want. So please email me. You can always get them at diggingdeeperjazz at gmail.com. And I'm happy to put you on our list, distribution list, and you'll just get the next one every week as they come out with the new video. Okay, look at the sheet here. What I did is put together four examples, 
starting from high gravity, high harmonic gravity, to a little bit less so. And what I've done is base this over rhythm changes. So let's look at the first one. What I did here is wrote out a standard bebop sounding line, a solo that we might imagine somebody playing. And you'll see that it is entirely chord tones. One, three, five, seven. So when we use chord tones, we are literally inside the chord. We are not playing a single note that is outside the chord. By definition, this is as inside the chords as we can get. Let me just play it for you. I played one extra note at the end that isn't on the sheet. I resolved it to the tonic, to a B-flat. Okay, so we can hear what that line sounds like. And I'm going to play it one more time for you with an accompaniment track, just playing the same thing. It's going to be an A section of rhythm changes. So I'm going to play those four measures, and I'm going to improvise the next four somewhat in that style. So just so you can hear what it sounds like to be very inside the chord changes. All right, so using our harmonic gravity knob, that was harmonic gravity turned full on. I was very inside the chord changes. There was not anything that I played that was outside, above, ambiguous at all, okay? So, um, and you know, yes, th this can be subjective. Oh, that sounded more in, that sounded more out. But scientifically, meaning analysis, theory, I was right inside the chords. Okay, let's look at the next one. Here I'm playing, it could be argued more simply, I'm playing a little more diatonically. So what I'm doing is using sort of a pentatonic sort of sound. Uh, I'm not addressing the chord changes, all the chords that are going by. I'm really thinking more of like B-flat, pentatonic, B-flat, bluesy kind of stuff. So someone could say, oh, but that's much more simple Sure, it's simple in approach, but the bottom line is when we look at some of those notes, they don't fit some of those chords. They're gonna sound good because of my melodic intention, but the harmonic gravity is now turned down. I'm above the chord changes. I'm not inside the chord changes. So if you've ever played the blues scale over a set of chord changes, you turn the harmonic gravity knob down a little bit and you allowed yourself to be above the chords a little bit. Let me play this example for you. So that doesn't sound at all strange or out or anything like that. When we turn the harmonic gravity knob down a little bit, I'm now hovering, I weigh, I weigh less. I'm hovering above the changes a bit. That's not a egregiously terrible, weird sound, right? It actually sounds kind of nice to our ears. So I'll do it one more time with the track. I'll play those four measures, then I'll improvise the next four measures in that style. Right. So we started with the harmonic gravity all the way on, way inside the chords. Now I turn the harmonic gravity down a little bit, and what my improvising sound like was very, very different, right? That's kind of interesting to think about that, how close to the harmony we're going to be entirely changes the, the melodic statement you're making. It was a big deal. It's a very cool way to think about it. Let's look at number three. Here I'm using some information from one of the videos I did previously talking about a more advanced way of playing over rhythm changes. And this is borrowing a little bit from Joe Henderson, one of my all-time improvising heroes, saxophone heroes. And what he's doing is superimposing some different chord changes. Now there's all sorts of different ways to turn down the harmonic gravity. So this is my version of, of for today, what we're gonna talk about. So this example, number three, is gonna sound even further above, away, against the chord changes. Here's what uh, it sounds like with no accompaniment. <laughs> So again, it 
didn't sound like BS to me. I heard organization, I heard tension and release, I heard movement and direction, but that was quite above the chord changes that are written. You can just look and analyze, oh, here's a D minor chord, what notes is he playing? Here's a G7, what notes is he playing? And uh, you'll see some of those mo notes make no sense in a traditional analysis kind of way. He had turned the harmonic gravity off less in a different way. So again, let me play it with uh, the accompaniment. You can hear it against the traditional chord changes. I'll play those four, and then I'll improvise four more sort of in that style, less, even less harmonic gravity at this point. All right an entirely different sound. So the first one, harmonic gravity all the way on. We turn the harmonic gravity down to play diatonically. So now harmonic gravity even less. We're floating above the chords, but to me, I still hear there's a connection. We're not free out in space somewhere. We're still related to the rhythm changes, but looser, right? And so now the fourth example is a, a transcription of uh, Tim Hagen's, the great trumpet player. I really encourage you to check out some Tim Hagen's. What an astounding player. Uh, so this is him playing over some rhythm changes from one of his albums. It was a Blue Note album called No Words. And this is a transcription of four measures that he played. And this is a much looser. So to me, he's floating. He might be floating away, but there's still this logic inside what he's playing. Here it is. Let me play this for you with the track. I'm going to play those four measures and then improvise four measures in that style. It's a very cool sound, and hopefully it didn't sound like absolute BS, that it wasn't at all linked to rhythm changes, that I was not paying attention to what was going on behind me. I definitely was. So that is what I hear a lot of people doing. So that's a great answer to the question of like, gosh, tell me what some of these modern guys are doing. I don't quite get it. It sounds fantastic. I don't know how to think about it or talk about it. This is a good answer. Not everybody does it this way, but this I hear a lot of this going on. Uh, the next question is, how do I do this? Uh, the answer, the, 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 the real trick, this, this takes a lot of time. So of course, can you nail the chord changes? Everything is relative to knowing how gravity works, right? Step one is being able to nail the chord changes. Can you improvise in the style of item number one on the sheet? Good, that's step one. That's why they call it one. Step one. Step two, can you improvise in that diatonic sort of setting? Okay, work on that. Step three is, do you know some of the cool substitutions or alternate chord changes that start taking us away? So when you're good at one, when you're good at number two, when you're good at number three, guess what? Your ear starts hearing things in the direction of number four. You have some language that hints at the fourth approach, being very, very loose, less harmonic gravity. So that is it. So for some of, you know, to me, this has been a 30-year progression of getting to the point where I can be somewhat convincing in the, in the fourth style. Very little harmonic gravity. It's scary. If you've ever seen that person floating away from the space station in the movie, they're scared. Yes, it's scary because you don't have Mother Earth holding you down. You don't have a lifeline. Holy crap, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. That is what it feels like. So you have to really have your wits about you to survive that kind of thing. So yes, when you hear somebody playing in this style and it's convincing, you're listening to a master. I hope that helps. I hope that's interesting to you, gives you a framework for listening, and gives you something to uh, sort of work on and shoot towards. Thank you so much. Hope we see you over at jazzwire.net where we can actually talk and study this stuff day in, day out together. All right, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.